The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating in a time of COVID. I mean, (laughs) no, that's not what our entire podcast is about, but we are dating in the time of COVID right now. It's about modern dating, and that's where we're at, right? Modern dating took another turn, as it always gives us those twists and turns. Always keeps us on our toes, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it it does. (laughs) But we are stoked this week because we have some dateable listeners coming to San Francisco. They're doing a little meetup uh, from all over the country, actually, as far as the East Coast. And Julie and I are meeting up with some of them for for dinner tomorrow night. That's going to be so fun to see everyone <laughs> in real life. It's amazing. So it's a group from the sounding board and some of them have been talking since March. Yeah. In happy hours, virtual happy hours in our Facebook group. We started doing happy hours. It was actually Swanee, one of our moderators ideas to do mm-hmm. happy hours. And I think it exceeded all our expectations. We didn't really know what we were going to get into if anyone would show up. And And we hit people at a time where everyone really needed that connection too. And we've evolved into the sounding board where now we're doing, people are like bearing their souls to each other. And I feel like the people that are about to meet probably know more about each other and their love lives and personal lives than maybe some of their their closest friends even. So it is amazing just how much you can get to know people virtually. And I had the pleasure of meeting up with one of our moderators, Shieldy, who is kind of the one that organized this entire trip too is her idea to come out and she matched a hundred percent it virtually what I you know like what she was IRL was a hundred percent who she was virtually so it is quite amazing how much like rapport you can build with people and we definitely screeched a little on the street when we saw each other oh <laughs> no bait and switch with shieldy she's authentically <laughs> herself virtually and in person I can't wait to meet her I can't I just can't wait to meet everyone one just to like see them in the flesh what in a crazy world so when shieldy and i were at brunch she said to me today she's like did you ever expect this that the podcast would lead to this Mm -hmm. and i said no (laughs) not at all but i'm so thankful it did and i think ultimately this is a podcast about dating and relationships in the romantic sense is kind of how we started but a lot of this is rooted on friendship all the connections in your lives. Like I think for both of us, we having each other even helped us through our Mm -hmm. romantic journeys. And I think all the folks in the sounding board that have really become friends, like really close friends, it's done the same for them. And I think dating is a lot easier when you do have that network of people that one, have your back, but also that your entire identity isn't around dating. Like you you have a life essentially that's filled with love, even if it's not in the romantic capacity while you're on your search for that. You got to fill your cup in some way. And if it's not romantically, you can fill it in other ways. Mm-hmm. I asked to someone this question who is a therapist and I asked her, do you ever get just drained? from a day of seeing clients. And she's like, first and foremost, I have to make sure my self-care is prioritized. Mm. I'm surrounded by good people and a good support system. And then I can take on clients. If I'm not in a good headspace, I actually cancel my appointments. Oh, wow. So I, that's really good to hear because, you know, it's, you got to help yourself before you help others. And that's when you're in your best self anyway. So I really appreciate that sentiment. And I I think this group just shows that this is such a fact in today's world where a lot of us are struggling. But if you feel like you're surrounded by people who truly support you and have your Mm -hmm. best interests at heart, then you're going to share that love with the rest of the world. I think also, even when you do find that person, it's a lot to put it all on one person, your entire happiness and interests. I think to 
expect someone wants to do exactly what you want to do at all times and can fill every you know void you have. It's a lot of pressure for someone. So I think having other outlets and people to talk to, that's why I never understand the people that drop their friends as soon as they're in a relationship. Mm. I just don't understand it. I think it's, it's clearly you want to make room for the new person in your life, but it doesn't mean that people that you've built relationships with for 10 plus years just oh, it's I don't need you anymore. Like, I don't understand why that thought process would even go through people's minds. And I think it's just so important to have a healthy relationship that you have all these different people that you can have relationships with. And we are going through some major changes in our lives. And it's so fun to be in each other's lives when we go through these changes. One of them is if you are watching this on YouTube, you'll see that both Julie and I are different places than normal. I'm at my parents' house. So I've got all of her family (laughs) photo albums behind me dating all the way back to the 80s but julie is at her new apartment yes i know you know i finally found a place for people that have heard i think i brought up how dating is like real estate a while ago and I've been looking for a place since January and anyone that's mm-hmm. in the home market knows how insane it is. There's clearly benefits of doing it right now from the pandemic, but everyone's kind of on it to get those benefits. So it became a complete clusterfuck, basically. Yep. And I think what's interesting, I'll relate this back to dating, I promise, is that I went in with maybe unrealistic expectations of what I wanted for my price range. And I basically got nothing that I was essentially looking for when I first started. (laughs) I mean, okay, that's a lie. There were some things that I was willing, I was unwilling to, they were deal breakers. I was unwilling to budge on. And that was location and Mm. an open, nice kitchen. Those were the two things Mm. I was completely unwilling to budge on. And I also realized like throughout the time looking that outdoor space was important to me. That was something that wasn't necessarily on my radar when I first started looking. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I, besides that, got nothing else that I was looking for. Except for a feeling. You got a feeling. Exactly. I got a feeling. I think that's like why I'm tying it back to dating is I think it's important to have a couple things that you're unwilling to budge on. You need to have some standards. But I think sometimes people can surprise you and things can surprise you and you can show up and something that you something I'll say in the sense of a home or someone in the sense of dating may not be what you were expecting, but ends up being what's perfect for you and ultimately what feels like home. Yes. And it's just like dating as well. I'm sure you looked at a shit ton of photos of homes. Oh my God. On Redfin yes. and all those websites. <laughs> and it's so easy to see which ones probably get a lot of swipes and likes oh, yes. because they're presented beautifully. They're staged well. And then they get overbid by like $200,000. Oh my God. Dollars, yep. Right? <laughs> Um, But then you look at some and you're like, there is potential. This person doesn't know how to take photos of their home. (laughs) The lighting is not great. It's not staged well, but I see good bones in this home. And there is no bidding war on this one yet because I see the potential in it. So it's, yeah, there are a lot of parallels. It's really funny. Oh, absolutely. And some places you think are going to be amazing and you show up and it looks like a complete dump. The photos are totally different for better or for worse. There's a lot of parallels with the data gaps. You know, the crazy thing in real estate is they can do virtual staging. So it's kind of like when people use filters for their photos. So you see on the photos, you see like beautiful staging and then you Mm -hmm. get there. There's no furniture because it's all virtually done. (laughs) So it's kind of like when people, you know, docker doctor up their, (laughs) yeah, their photos and you're like, who? And then you see them in person. You're like, wait, you look nothing like the photos. They're like, I did some virtual staging on my face. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm super excited. UA will be the first person besides my boyfriend to see the place. Yay! So you may be the last of my friends in California to meet my current partner, but you will be the first to see my new place. Yeah, so I average (laughs) out to be just okay. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm very excited to see you. I feel like uh, I'm clearly super excited to meet all of our listeners that are traveling all over. But it's been... I mean, I've been with my current partner for five months and yeah. I haven't, you haven't met him. I think we started dating last time you were out. We've Maybe. gone on one one or two dates, I think. So Maybe. I probably haven't seen you though for four or five months. Oh which is no, nuts. it's been longer. I think it's been longer. I haven't been back in a really long time, but I'm, I'm so excited to be back and I get to catch up on um, Julie's life. <laughs> 
So this this episode, enough about us. Let's get to this episode. I'm sure you've heard the build up. We have Shan Boudram, who, or Shan Booty, as she, some people would like to call her. She is phenomenal. You might have seen her on TV. You might have seen her on YouTube. You might have seen her on Instagram. She is everywhere because that girl is blowing up for a really great reason. She was such a wonderful interview. And we were mm-hmm. trying to schedule this interview for a long time when we finally did. And she's one of those people who lived up to what you expected her to be. Maybe she she surpassed my expectations. She was so sweet, but like so, so nice, yes. so nice, and so fucking down to earth. Like that oh, girl has yeah. no ego about her. She's like, girls, let's just talk. You know, like let's just be homies here. So I, I really enjoyed our, our talk with her. Absolutely, she has been on our list for a long time as mm-hmm. one of the the dream guests. You know, the people that we really wanted to interview just because one, she's has a lot of really interesting perspectives. So I think that and alone, historically, what we've had with sex is so terrible. So I love this emergence of all these sexologists and people that are really, you know, giving the 2021 view on sex. And I think it's so important. And we talk about sex, but we also talk about just she has a lot around flirting and desirability mm-hmm. and like playing the game but not playing the game it's ultimately being authentic but it's doing all the things you kind of need to do but in an authentic way and we talk about on the episode like we both struggle with the word flirting so much Yo, because yes. it become it feels so fake to us but I think we do it without realizing we're doing it mm-hmm. I think I caught myself a couple times being like oh I guess I am flirting more than I thought I think it's just how you perceive flirting. So I love how we got into all that of just how can you, you know, create that connection ultimately on dates, because a lot of it is how you come off and, you know, the sexual vibe that you're giving, even if you're not having sex, there's an indication of sex appeal that's that is on dates, like like it or not. And what I love about her is her is that we're changing our definition of what an expert is. You know, years ago, an expert is someone who has their PhD, who's like, 60 years years old telling Dr. you what Ruth. sex yeah <laughs> tells, telling you what sex should be like and like how to flirt and you're like wait you're my grandma's age how am i supposed to take this advice from you shan is totally different she's a millennial she has her degrees but she's also living all of her theories and perspectives so she's kind of you know, testing it out for us in her own marriage mm-hmm. and relaying the results with us so you feel more like like you're related, you know, yeah. she's much more relatable than some of those six year olds. <laughs> Six-year-old experts. Absolutely. I think what I love too, and we'll get into all of it in the episode, is we touch on all the stages of a relationship from the Mm. early meeting all the way to now what she's going through with her partner having a baby and how do you bring that desirability and sexuality into the picture when your life changes so much. And I think that's been a theme of this season, especially when we did the uh, the interview with Emily Nagoski too, Mm. of just you know, there's different seasons, there's different changes that come that relate to our romantic and sex lives, Mm -hmm. or our relationships and sex lives that, you know, sometimes don't even have to do with finding a partner. It's just life gets in the way or life exists or not even gets in the way, but evolves. And I think sometimes I thought it was super interesting. It's like sometimes you think like, oh, when you get married, have children, your sex life dies. And she basically, she showed us that that's not always the case. Well, her sex life is better, according yeah, to her. Exactly. You'll, you'll have to hear the story yes. for yourself. But I was trying to, I was trying to like allude to it. I, love- <laughs> <laughs> I gave it away. I gave away the cookie. Uh, <laughs> speaking of Emily Nagoski's episode, uh, someone wrote in a question related to that episode, which is also related to this mm-hmm. episode. This person said, uh, "Covid almost killed my libido." And now I'm getting back into dating. How do I get my libido back? Basically, how do I get my groove back? You know, I think a lot of us can relate to that. I definitely felt this big time when, you know, things were approaching with my current partner, I feel like I was super self-conscious. And I think a part of it is, you know, not rushing into things and being 
honest with people. I mm-hmm. think a lot of people are in this boat. And I think it's say- okay to say, hey, you know, I haven't been sexually active in a while because of COVID. I'm a little nervous. I think that's totally fine to say that and taking the time that you need. And maybe it's not rushing into things as fast as we maybe did in pre-COVID times. That's not always a bad thing. I think sometimes we were so quick to kiss and have sex and do all the things pre-COVID that we didn't let relationships build enough in modern times. So Mm -hmm. I think having that extra time and, you know, feeling a little more comfortable with someone too, that makes it easier to jump into bed with them when you feel that comfort that's been a building connection. Yeah, they say that when you jump into something kind of drastic, you kind of have to have a pre-phase. Like when people do their master cleanses, they have to have a pre-cleanse to make your body ready, get it, you know, get it prepped. So I think for something like this, there's nothing wrong with getting yourself prepped for this. Don't jump into it. I say self-care is so important. Buy something, wear something, eat something that makes you feel sexy. Watch movies and watch shows. What's that show on Netflix again? Sex Life? Oh, Sex so Life. <laughs> yeah. What that show, I mean, it's as crazy as it is. It gets yeah. me really horny. Just it, see that know? shower scene, right? <laughs> just any, right? Just put on any episode. I'm pretty sure you'll get turned on. But just feeling, getting yourself Self in the mood is so important. Uh, Some of you know, before my current relationship, I didn't have sex for a year. And I was scared that I I wouldn't know how to have sex again. I I wouldn't want to get horny again or know how to do it again. But I slowly started taking dance classes again, you Mm. know, heels, sexy dance class, pole class pole dance classes. I started watching sexy movies that I used to love. I started watching Janet Jackson music videos because I think she's so fucking sexy and all her videos are amazing. (laughs) So there are things that I know that I can do to turn me on. And this is a time to discover that. And then you just slowly ease yourself back in. Don't rush it. Absolutely. And I think also knowing it's a season and nothing is forever that, you know, I've definitely been there before, not even in COVID, but in other times where I've been in a drought. And then sometimes it is just realizing that you it's kind of like a bike, like riding a bike that you don't forget what you're doing and being okay that that's normal, that people go through this all the time. This is something that a lot of people are thinking and feeling right now. So there's nothing wrong with you if you feel self-conscious right this minute. I think it's just leaning into feeling that way and sharing that with your partner. Yes, yes. And don't put too much pressure on yourself. If this is something you truly want to seek out, go slow. You know, do a little foreplay with yourself. Don't just go straight into penetration. You just got to build up that desirability first before you can build it up with someone else. Yeah. And there's always virtual sex if you really need to get back (laughs) into it. (laughs) Virtual sex party. Go back to that episode. (laughs) There you go. So announcements... I think there was a big one last week. (laughs) Huge one. And it's not that Julie and I got engaged. (laughs) Can we just clarify? Yes. I really want to like Photoshop mock up some photos so bad. But (laughs) yes, some people did think that, right? And we we had to squash those rumors. That's still coming, but... (laughs) It is about finding your person. And yes, I did find you a... a But then she found someone else. Hey, you found someone else first. (laughs) If we're playing that game. It's okay. We're Polly. It's all good. We're not really Polly, but... (laughs) In our minds, we are. The new relationship. We're like non-sexual Polly. Not the... (laughs) I think that's just called friendship. (laughs) We're at a different level. Deeper level. Much deeper level. Much deeper level. But yes, we announce our finding your person program are are we settled on that name i think i I, think i don't know i'm still i still kind of like adventure because i think there is an adventure but it ultimately is ua and i as your guides to kind Mm -hmm. of get into the right mindset it's a combination of over the last five years we've been really trying to pinpoint what is it what are those common themes of people that we see find their person and evolve and we also looked at ourselves because we've clearly been on this journey our 
ourselves oh, as yes. well. But I think the commonalities that we've seen from all the people we've talked to and we've also pinpointed in ourselves is this balance of positivity, reflection, and action. And sometimes you can swing too much on one side versus another. And it really is that balance in the sweet spot. And that's what we've been working on is coming up with what that balance and sweet spot is and putting this all into, you know, this guided program with the two of us that you have access to through audio, through workbooks, through chats, even with us, like there's Mm going to be a lot included in this. And we're really confident that this is our best material yet. And we are so excited because we know a lot of people, I would gamble to say most of the people listening to Dateable, but not all are trying to ultimately find their person. And that's really what we want for all of you. We want people to be in happy, healthy relationships. We don't want people to be writing on our Facebook group, wondering why this person hasn't called them back or, you know, debating all these little things that ultimately don't matter. Because when you find that person, that stuff doesn't it doesn't even come into effect. And I think that's really where we are confident that all of you are incredible people and so introspective, so genuine. Like we've had the pleasure of meeting so many of you virtually this year. We've seen it firsthand. We want to provide all the info we have so we can help you. But there are only two of us. So (laughs) that is a reality. And we are only able to take a limited number of folks into this program, adventure, guide, navigator. (laughs) I'm just going to say all the names from now on. (laughs) Spiritual (laughs) journey. We will be doing ayahuasca together. I'm just kidding. We're not. (laughs) I'd be down. Julie would not be down, but I'd be down. That is optional. (laughs) It's not part of the course, but it's optional. If you want to do that before you get into this. You could do that on your own time that would be a wild time i actually think it would be super fun i i do want to try it sometime but you anyways. think it'd be fun i think so to have like the revelations that you have from it i think oh it'd be really okay fun. i've but never anyways. heard anybody describe it as fun it's <laughs> a lot it's deep anyway, anyways i was not included not included in this but it, it will off be. track on that <laughs> but we are taking a handful of people into this program and that's why we've released this early bird wait list so that you have first access to the registration link when we launch with it. We are still buttoning up what this entire offering is, including the timeline, including the price point, all of that, that's all in the works. But get on this early bird waitlist right now because when we when we release the registration link, you will have first access mm-hmm. and basically guarantees you a spot before we release it to anybody else. Yep. So this will also alert you to the six part video series that we're launching. So get on the wait list. It's findingyourperson.com straight to the point findingyourperson.com we were debating names and we said what better name than just finding your person because ultimately that's what it is and it's bonkers that that url is available i know and we it's snatched meant to it be. up meant to be we found our person in a domain <laughs> And then if you have any questions, a lot of you have been DMing us on Instagram. Perfect. Do that. We mm-hmm. love answering those questions you may have and um, give you a little bit of you know personal attention if you want yep. any of those questions answered. And we also did a Facebook Live in the Dateable Love in the Time of Corona Facebook group. That's our public group open to all. And if you aren't in that yet, go on over. It's pinned to the top. You can watch that live. Even though it's not live, you could always catch it. And plus, it's a really great place to be. So love in the time of Corona by the Dateable Podcast. We are keeping the name until COVID is over. And then we'll evaluate. (laughs) We thought we were going to be able to make the switch. Guess again. (laughs) Someone blamed us for COVID because we our name, (laughs) the name of the group. They're like, you can't change it now. And that's why COVID's still going. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. (laughs) Also, I feel like as much as I want to take credit for that, that's a very common name, love of the time of Corona. (laughs) Very. That's why we have so many people joining other groups thinking it's ours, but it's really not. But yes, you should join Love in the Time of Corona by Dateable Podcast. And also what we alluded to earlier, the sounding board. We won't go Mm -hmm. into that for this episode, but you can find out all the information on the sounding board at datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Yeah, there's a really good 
good convo that's happening, one of our virtual, you know, happy hours that have evolved into so much more about the decision to have kids this week. So there's some good stuff in there. Always (laughs) such good material. Cool. So let's go into a couple of our sponsors. This episode is fueled by Drizzly. How many of you have a full-blown bar in your house? I mean, I wish, but with a Drizzly app, you basically have that at the palm of your hands. Drizzly is the number one app for alcohol delivery because sometimes you need it now, like right now. Some cool features of the Drizzly app include getting drinks delivered to your door in under 60 minutes. I found this super helpful in this virtual world that we live in, where it's harder to meet up with friends or coworkers for a drink. So now I just send them drinks. Their selection is also huge. I'm always happy when I can find some Brunello wine or that George Clooney tequila. You know what I'm talking about. And finally, Drizzly connects you to local liquor stores where you can compare prices across all of them. So go check out Drizzly now by downloading the Drizzly app or going to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com and use the promo code SPICE5 for $5 off your first order. That's drizzly.com and use the code SPICE5 for $5 off. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. It is no surprise, Julie and I are huge fans of therapy, especially online therapy, and BetterHelp can do exactly just that. They match you with your own licensed therapist and connect you in a safe and private online environment. I was able to start communicating with my therapist in less than 48 hours hours super fast. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling. Their licensed professionals specialize in everything from stress management, uh, anxiety, trauma, dating, and grief. We at Dateable wish for all of you to live a happier, more wholesome life, and we think therapy and prioritizing your mental health will accomplish that. So as our listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash dateable. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. Cool. Let's hear it for Shan. Woo! Shan, it is so good to have you on our podcast. Finally, we've been wanting to have you on for so long. And we've been both following you for so long that I feel like it's almost surreal to be talking to you Mm -hmm. without you being a YouTube video talking, (laughs) you know, I love that you told me we weren't going to get foreplay. And here we are (laughs) licking each other. Kissing all the right spots. I am so. getting to every crevice. <laughs> there we go. Warming right. me up, buttering me up. Well, <laughs> consider me sauteed. I'm really into it. Thank you. And congratulations on your huge success, too, of your podcast. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Congrats to your baby. Hello. Of, of all the things we should be congratulating That's each other on. That's what I say on. every morning. I say congratulations to you, baby, because you <laughs> got born by me. Um, yeah. I am very grateful. That lucky baby. baby. How old is your baby? In like nine months? Yes. Did I do the calculation? Uh, yes. Wow. It's perfect. Nine months in, nine months out. <laughs> who is Shan Boudram? She is a certified intimacy educator and sexologist who teaches people to be more competent and confident. And I love that you are a self-proclaimed Dr. Ruth meets Rihanna because that is yes. absolutely true. And sometimes I see more of the Rihanna coming through, you know? Just Ooh, just well, you know what's funny is that in real life, nobody has ever compared me to Rihanna so I love that I put it out there in the universe <laughs> yeah. now people are like yeah I can kind of I kind of see get it I get that I get that you're like I did this I, put it I did it I manifested <laughs> yeah. this moment she spent the last 15 years discussing sex relationships attachment and intimacy she's a best selling author with her book The Game of Desire and was the host and executive producer on Quibi's number one daily show R.I.P. Quibi but you had their number one daily show Sexology with Sham <laughs> She also appeared on Netflix, Too Hot to Handle, one of my favorite guilty pleasure shows. 
<laughs> in addition to The View, Good Morning America, Dr. Oz, just to name a few. She's now serving as a sex and relationship expert on my crush's show, Peacock's new dating show called X-Rated, hosted by Andy Cohen. And that's premiering when? We've been hearing lots of different dates. Oh, it's been out. It's there right now. Go yeah. binge it. Oh, it's already episodes, out. It's dry. Okay. It just came out. So it's totally it just, fine. It came out like on Thursday. That's what I'm doing immediately after this. It just immediately. <laughs> Andy Cohen. And that's how I mean. advertising works. <laughs> <laughs> that's how word of mouth works. There's even more about Shan. She's originally from Toronto, currently lives in LA, and she is married with, as we mentioned, a nine-month-old baby. So how does one get into sex education? How did you become a certified sex educator? So the short answer to this is that I had a super shitty teen sex life, and mm. I thought to myself, either everybody, a la the Catholic school that I went to and my parents and every other elder was right that this is a terrible area of life that only results in green penises and unwanted babies and <laughs> displeasure or I'm interacting with this in the wrong way and I need to mm. educate myself to try something new. So I decided before I joined uh, a nun covenant that I would try something new and so I got a library card and I read every book possible about sex education that I could over a summer and I had an aha moment where it was like wow there's great information but it's really boring and unapproachable, I wonder if I could be the person who makes sex education sexy. And of course, there's other people who were doing that, but they were older and white in, in my time, this mm -hmm, is 15 mm -hmm. years ago. So obviously now the market's definitely opened up and there's a ton of great examples of people doing this kind of work. But back in the day in 2005, when I had this thought, I didn't know of anybody else, you know, who I could name or locate even that looked like me, who sounded like mm -hmm. me, who was doing that work. So that's where my initiating thought was. I then moved to California a few years years later. And then I got an associate in sex education. And then I also became certified as a sexologist from that same institution. And then now I'm back in school now to get a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Human Development. So I can hopefully, you know, end up with a title of behavioral psychologist, mm. which just allows me to attack the word intimacy from all mm. angles from Hell yeah. a psychological perspective, from a biological perspective, um, and then from a journalistic perspective, which is like my earliest roots because I am curious for a living and I want to push the boundaries. And more than that, I'm of the people. Like I want to talk and reflect the experiences mm -hmm. of other people. So that's mm. pretty much how I became who I am. So what has been the biggest surprise that you've encountered with people's relationships, especially as it pertains to sex? I think the biggest surprise is how much there's a positive correlation between awareness and education and people's positive results. Does that sound ridiculous? But in that, I mean, like I've seen so much good that has come from the kind of work that I'm doing and the kind of work that's being done, even just in terms of, because I've been in the space for a while now the topics that are taboo are so different than the taboo topics mm. than they were. Mm. Now the questions that I'm getting are so much different than the questions that I used to get. Like if you just give people a little bit of knowledge and information, they can truly take that and apply that to make meaningful changes in their life. So I think for a long time, the question has been, is sex education necessary? Which I've definitely debated. Mm. It has been, do I need to go to therapy? The question has been, well, why do I have to learn about how to date? But from my perspective, I have watched people just take in little bits of information and seeing how that has completely made an impact in the quality and quantity of problems that they're having. So the biggest aha that I've had in my career is like, wow, this shit really works. This shit really does work. And, I, you know, Julie, I'm going to ask you, do you remember who was in your sex education videos or who was doing your sex education? Because all I remember is a woman that looked like my grandma if she were white telling yeah. me not to have sex because I would get pregnant or have an STD at the time it was called an STD. And I remember just being like, first of all, this woman does not scream sex to me at all. And no. I cannot relate to her. And second of all, I'm never going to have fuck anybody because I'm just going to get <laughs> pregnant and have STDs for the rest of my life. Well, it definitely was a nurse for sure. I always think of mean girls when they're like, you will get an STD and die. Like that's like the, <laughs> you know, it's, that's the message that's been implanted though for so long. And I think we're really excited to talk to you about just desire overall. Like mm -hmm. that can be sexual desire, but just even desire desire in relationships. I think your book, first of all, I love the book, Game of Desire. I think that's like Thank the you, best, it's a great title too. <laughs> the best way. Yeah. And I think it's like, what does desire mean to you? Because I feel like there's so many definitions mm -hmm. of that word. I feel like simplified is just what do you want, right? Like what 
what do you want when you wake up in the morning? What is the thing that crosses your mind, either as a hope, as a dream, or as a goal? I think that that's what our desires are. I think sometimes our desires can feel like whimsical goals, and that's okay too. But when you answer or think about in relation to intimacy in particular, you know, what do you want? Those are your desires. So it's a fun game right now. You know, what do you guys want? I want ice cream. I desire <laughs> ice cream all the fucking time. I <laughs> said in regards to intimacy, you cheater. <laughs> well, you do we love desire ice cream. I desire ice cream on my body. <laughs> on my body during. You know what I desire? I desire words of romantic words during sex. Mm. Like you look beautiful. You look ravishing. I don't know what it is. Like you smell amazing. Just that extra 10% of making me feel desirable. Yeah. I think the desirable piece is interesting because I feel the same way. It's like you just want to be wanted by your partner. It's like even verbally, I think it's action wise too. It's like sometimes you just want that person to, you know, come up and lay one on you, right? What do you desire? <laughs> I think like if I'm honest, I was trying to reflect on that. Like, what is the thing that I desire right now? Like I have, I have a great, I, I have a, a life partner that I have a great relationship with. And I just like couldn't ask for anything more from that. And I think we're on a really great wavelength right now. So I think currently I desire a flirt buddy who's outside of my relationship mm. that we're both really clear oh. on like that being a thing. Um, I think I have like pseudo people right now where it's like kind of danced around, but I would want somebody who just like knows what it is and like we're really direct about it. I think that'd be fun. Ooh, that should be a service. Service. It should buddy. be a service. I mean, it really technically is a service. There's a, a artificial intelligence bot that's called Slutbot. And no. you basically, yeah, you sext with Slutbot. Oh my God. Um, so I, in theory, and I am signed up for that. So in theory, I do have that, but you know. But you know, a, it's human. a bot. Yeah. I know it's a bot. <laughs> and then sometimes when I say things, you know, that they'll come back to something that's like not really quite like what I said responding. I'm like, this needs some kinks to be worked out. So. Well, since we're talking about this, do you do you think that by building desire and intimacy with someone else can actually create more intimacy in your current partnership? In my current partnership, yes, because mm. of how myself and my life partner, one, initiated our relationship to the conversations that we've had so that I know you know, how it would benefit. And I also know myself. I consider myself like somewhat of a cuckolder where I feel like I'm turned on by the idea of my partner, one, experiencing desire um, mm. for other people, but also being desired by other people. So I know for me, it definitely would help to build desire for somebody who is extremely monogamous. It would do quite the opposite. So mm. there's there's no, mm. you know, I mean, I always say that like there's no one size fits all because it makes no, it right. seem like everyone's different. I mean, people are different within like a spectrum of choices. So it doesn't right. mean that we still can't make predictions and like, you know, clear cut rules. But I think it is an important question to ask. So let's talk about desirability. Like we hear <laughs> from our listeners. <laughs> it's a good topic. We hear from our listeners all the time that they go on dates and it's kind of either meh or they like fall in the friend zone. And there's like none of that like oomph that you you need like how can people kind of add that desirability without necessarily like having sex or leading with sexual things so in the game of desire julie which you read yes bitch, um, <laughs> <laughs> i think that there's like a couple of things that like stick out to me for that one the thing i talked about is that in many ways when you're setting up a date with somebody you're putting the ingredients together for stir fry so the ingredients mm. for stir fry and ramen are pretty identical, except the difference is if you've got ramen, there's like a broth to it. Um, and so when you have stir fry, you have your noodles, you have your vegetables, you have your egg, you have like whatever meat you want to throw in there and that's there. When you go on the date, you're basically figuring out if there is that broth, that secret sauce. And there's no mm. way of knowing other than being there, mm -hmm. but stir fry is still delicious. So the point that I'm making to that is that <laughs> Not every date has to have that like sauce and broth to it for it still to be enjoyable and an experience. You're like, I'm glad that I went. Maybe you don't even go a second date, but nonetheless, like if you do your due diligence, you shouldn't be exhausted by the fact that you don't have that spark. Because that spark is like really just the true magic that again, you can't even assume is going to be there. You just have to be hopeful. But if you want to increase the chances, like just say you have everything there and the broth is there, you can feel it and see it, but no one's pouring it. There was a section that this stripper did that was like how to flirt like a stripper. Mm. And because strippers in essence have this job of creating chemistry instantly with people, they have to go over to somebody and create this interaction that feels desire rich. 
And to do that, um, she said that she talks about the forbidden pleasures of life. So rather than the topics being mundane, like what do you do for a living? How was your day? How was the weather going? Did you watch the game last night? It's talk about splurges. Talk about mm. vacations you love to be on. Talk mm. about food, the best food you've ever eaten before. Talk about sex. I mean, that's just in itself a topic that's obviously going to breed desire and, and um, sexual chemistry if you lean into. But if you don't want to be that overt, still talk about the things that light people's eyes up. You know, what is the craziest thing that you've ever Ever done? What's the last time that you thought to yourself, I could die and I would be happy? Like, what, where, what were you doing in those moments? And that that elicits people's arousal. Mm. Arousal transfer is something that occurs when you have like a heightened sense of being or you have heightened senses or you're in fight or flight. And when arousal transfer happens, you can take that and apply it to other areas of arousal. Mm. So this can happen like during anger. So if I am really angry at my partner, that can be transformed into like uh, angry sex because I'm at a heightened state of arousal. So how can you mimic that? Like how can I get somebody in a heightened state, which makes it naturally easy for us to transfer that over into like a romantic state. So there's even studies that say that if you go on a date, there was like a, a swinging bridge study. So people went on a date, one on a bridge that was not swinging and talked mm. about like a set range of topics that the researchers had put out. And then another exact same thing was replicated, but on a swinging bridge. And couples who were on the swinging bridge all said that they felt more attraction to each other just because there was uh -huh. an element of danger. So arousal that brought that sauce to it. So that's two part, part answer to say, sometimes there's just no, there is no chance of sauce. You just don't have it with that person. That's right. cool. And sometimes the sauce is there, but nobody's pouring it. So you have to create the environment where the sauce spills over. Yeah, just create danger. <laughs> Like just be in the middle of the street. If that's what you heard, you know, like yes. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or have a date. No, but that makes yeah. hanging upside down. I just think it's funny, like the seductiveness that doesn't have to be sexual. Like the like you hear like food porn all the time. And even you, when mm -hmm. you were asking, what do you desire? You went to ice cream. Like that's such an interesting connection that I would not have thought about to do stuff in a PG way that could kind of get those juices flowing. Yeah, and I love that because you are also getting away from the data review questions mm -hmm. of like, what do you do? Uh, how did you get here? How did you like, what was your childhood like? Who can Those are questions people are just in autopilot for. But for something like this, a question that's like, what's been the best vacation you've taken recently? That puts me in a different mode of thinking. So it, it makes me more present in the moment, too. And speaking of desirability, I have a friend who just like fucking oozes sex. Mm. She walks down the street and I'm just like, damn, girl, you are just yeah. oozing sex. And I feel like it's a natural mm -hmm. appeal that she was just born with. I don't know how. <laughs> but for others who may not be oozing sex but want to increase their sexual appeal, do you have any advice or tips for people who just want to up their sex appeal? I mean, that's legit legitimately like you described the premise of my book game of desire which now it seems like i'm doing a yeah. cheesy ad for that i'm not you guys just keep like teeing me up no, and i'm like just said no <laughs> the ball is here so should i hit it but a hundred percent like i recognize there's a school of thought that attractive is a word that we utilize to people who are bestowed the gift of being in line with whatever the current beauty standards are I said mm. to say because attractive five years ago is different from attractive 15 years ago. But the truth of the matter is attractive boiled down is just somebody who has the ability to draw people in. And seduction, which we again use to describe a friend like your friend who just oozes sex and they mm -hmm. just like have that thing to them where it, that's just the ability to draw people in and have them wanting to come back for more. And it's an interest factor. There's an it factor about you that makes me glance a second time and not just glance, but maybe even try to revisit you a second time. Like I want to be in your presence. Like I'm drawn into you you. And we think about these things like either you have it or you don't. And in life, those things that exist, like in the NBA, there are people who are just tall as fuck and right. coordinated as fuck. And it just worked for them. Yeah. But there's also the people in the NBA who weren't that tall or weren't necessarily mm -hmm. like perfectly built, but just worked their asses off and wanted to be exceptional and decided that this is an area they wanted to devote themselves to. So I feel like my book, The Game of Desire, was written for that latter person where it's like, yeah, maybe you weren't dealt the perfect biological cards. Um, again, that has nothing to do with actual beauty. It has to do with what the beauty standards are promoting at that given time and in your given culture. And maybe mm -hmm. you're not just somebody who naturally oozes seduction in that traditional way that we think when we think about the person who has what well, my friend would refer to as the club walk. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe that's not you, but that doesn't mean that you can't, one, learn to do that if you wanted to. And also to like the beauty of the time that we live in now, if you want to fit in with traditional beauty standards, 
records. There's so many tools. Like it's so nuts mm. how literally anybody could be Rihanna. We used to look at superstars as incredible because they could change their hair every day. They could mm -hmm. change their wardrobe constantly. They could be two different yep. people in the same week. And then now, like thanks to I think what social media and Amazon has done, anybody can do that. Like I got a green wig and a purple wig like on deck. Like, let's go. So let's go. <laughs> if you wanted to do that, that's available to you. But on the flip side, if you want to do it in your own way, there's also other ways of achieving that goal without going about it by the most common route. So mm. have not said a damn single tip for you because <laughs> I think the most important thing is just to acknowledge that, that it is possible. Yeah. Um, like a quick and dirty tip, let me say for if you want to be more attractive, ask people a follow-up question. Oh, mm. You know, like, hey, <laughs> so how's hot. your day going? Oh, it's really good. You know, I just came from the DMV, blah, 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 da, da, da. Oh, what were we at the DMV for? Oh, you listened to what I just said? Like, yes. wow. Um, and like one of my favorite seduction styles from the art of seduction is something called the ideal lover. And the ideal lover is somebody who knows how to speak to someone's highest potential. And the secret to that is remembering what's important to people and bringing it up. So if you work at mm. Denny's, but I talk to you once while I was in line and you told me that like, I'm thinking of opening up a nail shop. If the next time I see you, I'm like, oh, like how's the nail shop going? Have you like looked at places in the area? I'm speaking to your highest potential. Like I'm exciting you based on the version of who you want to become. So when I'm around mm. you, I feel like I'm in reflection of the self that I desire to be. And thus I desire to be around you. Like that's the most basic ass way I think to be attractive. That's so interesting. Cause you think like people think of when you're trying to like up your attraction, it's all about physical traits, but you clearly, mm -hmm. Listed none of them, and it's all about making that other person feel good essentially. Like you're using that essence. I guess, like you mentioned, a lot of the reason why you got in this field is from your own seeing sex and not being what you thought it would be. Did you always kind of like ooze this like confidence, or is this something you had to learn? I don't know about that. I think I might. I, I have two really confident parents. My dad's a paramedic, my mom's a nurse. My dad is a wild ass person. Like, I think in life, if you want to understand, understand me more. You have to watch one video with my dad. You're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. So <laughs> I would be hard pressed to say, I mean, I also am somebody, you know, who's a person of color who went to an all white school. And so I was never looked at as attractive. And mm -hmm. I definitely had to fight for recognition or attention. And sometimes the way that I fought wasn't wasn't always appealing either, because, you know, I was I was mean to other people in order to like raise myself up in the status and eyes mm -hmm. of like my peers. So the way that I tried to get attention, I don't think was necessarily the healthiest way. So but that isn't to say that I wasn't an unconfident person because I always fought. I think that's a part of confidence too, is like, do you feel like you deserve to be shiny or looked at like a shiny object? So I think I've always had that notion in my brain that like I deserve to be shiny, but the way that I advertise myself, I don't think was always like the best or, you know, in line with what my highest self or potential is. So I think uh, that to say, I do think that I'm always somebody who had a belief system that I mattered. And I think that's a base. A lot of people don't have that. And I don't want to take that for granted, like because everyone's start lines a little bit different. But I think my confidence sometimes got in the way because I would do bad things very deliberately and very aggressively. So that applied to my mm. sex life. I had a lot of sex before I realized this something is going wrong because I was doing it the wrong way very aggressively. And similarly with me, when it came to dating, I wrote The Game of Desire because a few years before, I just had such trash. I'm one of those people who was like, hate all my exes, don't want to talk to none of those motherfuckers, hate dating, mm. I'm exhausted by the experiences, hate dating apps. And then I was like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of commonality in my dislike for things that are based around connecting with somebody else is the common and denominator the way that I'm interacting with it. So I feel like, again, I was very confident, um, but my technique was just not finessed or not aligned with, again, with what I ultimately desired. So I ended up mm -hmm. confidently putting myself in shitty scenarios until I was mm -hmm. like, wait a second, like, should I just turn this car around and start again and see where this takes me instead. Right. right. Okay, let's hold that thought so we can get into a few quick messages. This episode is made possible by Lugs. Amidst the golden age of the 90s, Lugs found its footing as a leader within the footwear and fashion space. Priding itself on quality materials and supreme comfort, the brand never wavered with the passing of trends. Whether you remember the brand's early appeal within the hip-hop culture or the countless celebrity endorsements, one thing remains the same, Lugs' distinctive style. Julie and I both have a few different styles of Lugs shoes ranging from their iconic boots to their canvas sneakers. Even though they're 
are so different in style, one thing remains the same. They're all so comfortable and light. I love my flirt high zip boots that I can wear with cute summer dresses and my canvas sneakers go so perfectly with my jeans and t-shirts. Fun, comfortable, everyday wear, realistically priced and affordable. So go treat yourself. You can never have too many pairs of lugs. Exclusively for our beautiful listeners, get 30% off full price items now by going to lugs.com and entering the code DATEABLE. Again, that's L-U-G-Z.com and entering the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E for 30% off full price items. Let's face it, it's a weird time to be dating or developing relationships. Have you recently decided that you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes one-on-one coffee dates with us, a monthly dateable live after show, exclusive audio content, and much more. Allow Julie and I become your dating Sherpas to provide real-time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Okay, let's get back into this convo. How did you meet your current partner? Girl, the good old fashioned way. Went to the club. Uh, really. <laughs> <laughs> Were you doing the club walk? That good old 1950s way. Yeah, I essentially, um, we met through a mutual friend, which statistically before meeting online was the most popular way. Mm-hmm. That was like the most popular way of all time. And there's a cool thing about that because one, there's a layer of accountability that's between you and that person. Yes. And two, it's like, oh, if this person that I know that I mess with messes with this person, Mm -hmm. it's like a higher likelihood that we probably are going to be like aligned when it comes to values. Cause um, I liked who we met as a result of, and that person actually ended up being at our wedding too. Like this is a, now a person Mm. that was important in both of our lives. Mm -hmm. So I met him at the club, but we only were both Mm -hmm. at that party because of a mutual friend. So that's probably the easier way of saying it. And I'm only speaking from what I've seen on social media, but it seems like you two are very aligned sexually, energy wise. Mm -hmm. So was it always like that from the get go? Or did you develop this together? No, we started out as fuck buddies. So that was 100%. Uh, Like, I think that was the uh, only thing that we established. (laughs) Like, I don't, he's uh, six years younger than me too. So that played a big role. And I, at the time that I met him, I was on my process of re-educating myself because I just come out of a relationship that was really negative. I was Mm. potentially going to be deported from the country because my immigration visa was running up. It was just like a lot of things in my life were in flux. And so the last thing I was thinking about was, oh, I wonder if I could meet my forever partner. I was like, I wonder if I can stay here another month. So I just (laughs) wanted, I just came out of a situation. I just wanted to have fun and to explore my body and to be with somebody who was interested in that agenda too and can do it in a great way. So the base way that we aligned was on sexuality, which is why I think Mm. in our marriage, um, it's a thing that I've really prioritized. And through pregnancy, you know, where that gave struggles and even after pregnancy and having a baby, there were struggles with that. But I never like let that fall to the wayside because I'm like, this is the thing that brought us together. Mm -hmm. Just like if we came together Mm -hmm. because you were my sugar daddy, I would expect (laughs) that like the finances would be important to us because that's the reason why we got together to begin with. So I'm kind of like that with him and I, like not to say that we always have a naturally great sex drive or sex chemistry, but I prioritize it. So I think that it's it's maintained and, and been pretty spectacular throughout. I was going to ask you guys, how, how important is sex to you in your relationships? Oh, we were just talking about this. We're just, I think intimacy is very important. I do too. I think for me, it's more than just like a physical act too. It's like the act of being close to your partner. And I think if you strip that away, then they're just a friend. And I'm not saying that they can't be a friend too, but I think having those together is what makes someone that significant other. I love that. Yeah. And we were just talking about the whole quality over quantity thing because I hate comparing frequency of sex with with friends Mm -hmm. because it always makes me feel like shit. You know, you always have friends who are like fucking every minute. Yes. Of the day. (laughs) And you're like, really? Are you really? But yes, I should be doing the same thing. Right. And then you have this notion that once you've been in a relationship with someone for a while, especially after having a baby, the sex dies down. But for me, I think the pressure gets lifted when you think about the quality of the intimacy and the sex. And so that part is really important that my partner and I are always doing a check in on how intimate 
intimate do we feel with each other? Even if the physical sex is not there, do we still feel closely connected? I mean, you're the perfect one for us to ask this to, Shan, because I feel like I'm in a fairly new relationship. It's like four months in. Congratulations. Thank you. It's not like super, you know, we're in the the honeymoon stage. And you know what's a trip to think about? Remember me in high school when we would celebrate that shit? Like, (laughs) yes, we've been together for three months. You're like, it's been two weeks. I don't know. I I still think that you should celebrate that stuff because I think it's nice to celebrate. But um, I guess like my question for you is like kind of what you was saying is I sometimes fear the different life stages coming down and how that impacts sex life. And I think some of it's inevitable. Like when you have a child immediately after birth, you're probably not ready to go back and have sex. But like, how have you navigated that? through, you know, childbirth and a long term relationship. Yeah, I think that the changes are inevitable. And if you recognize that it just becomes less daunting. I think people's fear is that it's going to change. Like, what if our sex life changes? Like, I'm here to let you know it does. Right. And you can accept that. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because change doesn't mean for the worse. It can mean better. There's obviously going to be a difference in how you can connect sexually once you now have a person in your home who doesn't consider you at all, who cries whenever they want, who wakes up whenever they want, <laughs> yep. like who interrupts, who doesn't have any like consideration at all. So like, of course there's going to be a difference in how you sexually connected before that reality to now. Doesn't mean that it's worse though. I can tell you from us going through the pandemic where we had all access to sex versus us now where we have limited windows of sex, I actually prefer the sex now. I Mm. think because we're more intentional about it Mm. and it's not like a given. So when we have those times, it just takes for 2 p.m. for him to walk into my office and like look at me and drop his pants. (laughs) And we're like, oh, shit, it's on and I know it versus now it's like we are around each other all the time and there's no barriers. There's no friction, really. It's just like constant, you know, maybe we could be doing this. And when you do it, you're like, oh, we do this. We can do this tomorrow. We could do this a week from now. It doesn't really matter. So I think that the sex has gotten a lot better since we've had a baby. Um, but I think because I was open to the fact that I knew it, it wouldn't be the same, I invited mm-hmm. more potential for it to be different but better uh, because I leaned into the fact that, yeah, things are not the same as they were before. I love that. That's so <laughs> I guess that that gives a lot of hope, too. And I like the thought yes. of like reimagining it, too. So it's interesting. I feel like at the start of a relationship when you don't know if you're going to see this person again or you're very unaware of like where things are going. I feel like the sex is really hot then because it's kind of like that scarcity, what you're now describing in your marriage after a kid. So it's yes. interesting how you can like bring it back and forth no matter what life stage you're at. I think imagination is such a big part to do with it, right? Like it is using your brain as the other sexual organ that also needs to be stimulated. But like anything else, like you got to do the work yourself too. Like you have to prime yourself and put yourself in the right headspace and doing that with your partner, which just means more intentional dialogue. Uh, Jared and I talk probably like, I would say like unattractively about our sex life. I mean, just to the point, there's no real (laughs) mystery left. It's funny because somebody asked that question about, you know, when we first got pregnant or when I first got pregnant, Um, how did that impact our sex life? And Jared was like, yeah, the first time that we had sex, I couldn't get hard because I just couldn't get the idea to my head that there was a baby that I was Mm. like possibly injuring. And Uh they were like, well, how did you overcome that? And didn't she feel insecure? Like, how did it? He's like, no, we talked about it immediately after. And Mm. we just Uh do that. So as soon as I had a baby, for example, and I felt really good in my body for the first time because third trimester, you just do not, uh, you can't sleep sitting up. Mm-hmm. You can't move without like giving yourself a pep talk first. Everything hurts. You're uncomfortable. It's just like your body just feels really alien to you. And so when I had the baby and I now felt like I was back to being a solo, solo occupant and it felt great, but I wasn't getting desire from my partner. I didn't let it breed up. I was like, Hey, you didn't tell me I look sexy today. Like what the mm. fuck is going on? Like, mm. I really feel like, you know, I need this from you and you're not providing it. And I was like, do I need a flirt buddy? Like, what's up like because mama's got needs that (laughs) extend beyond changing Mm -hmm. diapers and carrying this baby around in my sling at all times like can you be my partner in that or like how can we meet in the middle and it took a while for us to kind of find our footing and I I said with pride like we're in a really great space right now and I think that's the result of just having uncomfortable conversations literally the moment that either of us has the thought are your this is gonna be a maybe an uncomfortable question are your parents sexual do you come from a sexual family I I would answer that yes and 
and no. I would say that um, now I would answer yes, but I think my mom thought a form of education was in self-denial. So my mm. mom is one of those moms uh. who would just never tell any personal experiences or just did not want us to view her in that light. Like I didn't realize that my mom had hookups until I was like mm. in my mid-20s because she was like, you know, I just, I had my first sexual experience with someone that I loved and then I met your father and then we had you just and you're skipped like, a whole oh, chapter how, yeah. like, how am I going to tell this person that I just had sex with a carrot last night where they've had this perfect sex life so <laughs> I didn't really feel like she was somebody I could go to to talk about my less than storybook Disney Channel experiences or desires mm. because she always positioned herself like really by the book and it wasn't until I got mm. older and started doing what I do for a living and I got past the years of resistance they had to what I was doing for a living that they actually started to open up and say, you know, here's how your work applies to me. Oh, shit. So you've obviously talked to like a shit ton of people. Like what would you say is kind of the differences in the struggles with desirability when you're dating versus you're in a long term relationship like you are? You know what? Interestingly, I mean, I think we can like talk about this like, you know, anecdotally as we go around, even just amongst okay. the three of us, like what are your stri- struggles mm-hmm. when it comes to desirability? I don't necessarily know if they're that much different. I guess other than the fact that if you're dating, you're looking for it from anyone. And Mm. if you're in a relationship, you're looking for it from your person. Um, And then sort of similar sometimes is that you're getting too much desire from someone that you don't desire. And that does also happen in long-term relationships where you lose that drive for your partner and they still have it for you. And now you're in that uncomfortable disconnect there. So I think because desire is pretty linear, like you have it or you don't. Right. Or you're trying to create it or you're trying to stop yourself from experiencing it because you might desire something that's unhealthy for you. Mm. Um, You might be drawn to a person that you ultimately know, like outside from the sex or getting affection from them, they're not an additive person to your life. So I feel like the mathematical equation there is pretty the same across the board. But I challenge that question back to you because I might have a blind spot. The only thing I can think of is when you're single you're kind of trying to get desire from everyone. Like people feel like they want everyone to swipe mm. right on them on a dating app, for instance. When I still it- want that. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to be Vanity hot at the swipes. hot dog stand. I still want to be hot at Home Depot. I still want that. Oh, I'm pretty sure you're always hot at Home Depot. <laughs> if anyone wants to feel desire, just go to Home Depot. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so I've proven wrong that it could not end when you're single, but maybe like when you're, I guess if you're in a monogamous setting, you're trying to like find that person more opposed Mm -hmm. to like you are kind of maintain and create with an individual kind of what you were saying. But yeah, maybe I'm proven wrong that you can still want it from everyone. Interesting. Like, cause you know, I think about that, like a lot of people will say that, you know, when they're monogamous, they don't have eyes for anybody else, which, yeah. you know, is completely mm, natural. And under- I mean, it's true. It genuinely is true for some people, but if we're looking at, it's like the Kinsey scale, right? Like it goes from zero to six. How many people statistically are going to be zeros or sixes? Like most people are going to be somewhere in the sexual fluid mm-hmm. space. So if we're thinking about desirability, like I don't ever desire anyone but my my partner and I desire everyone but my partner, like those two extremes probably exist very rarely. And most of us are somewhere in the, in the center of that. Um, But I wonder if on the flip side, even if you only desire your partner, do you only want your partner to desire you? Or do you not secretly hope that other people also want to have sex Mm. with you? Mm. Good question. Good question. I mean, I will admit that it turns me on when we go somewhere and people are staring at my man. It turns me on like, yes, yes, that's right. I get to hit that tonight. (laughs) Yeah, I may not, but I get to. (laughs) (laughs) I have the option. (laughs) But I guess for some people that could also it could kind of transform into jealousy I can I can see it going into a dangerous path. But I think for my partnership, I think where the desirability struggle for us is when we were just dating, whenever we met up, it was purely for the context of dating. So it was romantic. You go on dates and you're not thinking about your grocery shopping and the laundry and the dishes that are in the in the sink because you haven't shared that with each other. But as soon as we moved in together, I think the daily struggles turned into our desirability struggles. 
struggles mm. and my desire for him has shifted. It's no longer the same as before because now there's this added domestic layer to it. So I, I'm still, we're still navigating around that as well. It's just like, how do I have sex without thinking about my checklist? But it, at least we can keep an open communication about that. And I, I appreciate the uncomfortable conversations because that's what helps us to create more desirability for each other. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, even that there are some people who prefer to leave some things unsaid and that's possible because then you're just you could just it's like someone's birthday you can either ask what do you want for your birthday or you could guess and there's something cool about guessing what the perfect thing is but it's also not that cool when you guess fucking wrong so when you don't have these <laughs> yes. conversations you have a high chance of just guessing wrong but some people prefer that in the event that you do guess right then it's like oh, you really know me and there's some value in that I guess um, I don't prioritize that as much as I just prioritize getting what I want and getting mm. what the other person wants so I just rather ask you like what do you want for your birthday yeah it's, i mean you can't go wrong with that right <laughs> i think it's uh it's it's interesting though i mean from the standpoint of getting into a relationship and being in there long term and then having to reimagine that i always tell people too it's when we first meet people we have to also acknowledge that we're on the roller coaster of neurochemicals so you don't have mm -hmm. to work that hard to facilitate desire because biology is like this is someone new we want you to bond with them and in order for that to happen they have to to make this person seem as exciting and as thrilling and as lust filled as possible to you. But then once that bond has been created and your brain is like, okay, well, we're not going anywhere. It now shuts off those neurochemicals because you don't need them to stick around, but you might like to have them because it makes sticking around more exciting. But now you're in charge of finding ways to create like a synthetic version of that newness. And I think a lot of people mistakenly interpret the loss of those rushes of emotions as a loss for attraction to your partner. And it's mm. not that. It's not that you don't love them anymore or don't like them anymore. It's that, that your body now recognizes that you've moved into a new phase and you don't need that anymore to stay together. But if you still want it, you can be more intentional about creating it. So the term I, that's coming to mind is flirting. And I know you talk about this term a lot. And I feel like I love the foundation of what flirting means. But there's something about the term that makes it feel so like antiquated to me and like <laughs> juvenile. Oh, but I fine. feel like you need Do you hate it about that? Or do you like that about it? I hate it about that. Like, I feel like anytime like you and I have been asked to talk about flirting, we kind of get this like feeling of like, yeah, but I think the core of what it is, is to like show that desire and like, you know, make that person feel special and wanted, I think is very essential at all stages of a relationship. Like, how do you look at flirting? And like, how would you reframe that for us? I use the word flirting like 50,000 times a day. So it's interesting because <laughs> I call people flirts. I accuse people of flirting with me. Like yesterday, somebody was over. I'm like, you're just flirting with my baby. Like, why are you being so flirty? Um, which, you know, <laughs> might feel weird. But to me, uh, my favorite definition is um, Arrows was an expert in my book at the time. I was referred to as, as Ari. But um, Arrows said that flirting is just communication plus sparks. Mm -hmm. And I love that definition because, excuse me, where where's the wood section? and excuse me I'm looking for the section where the wood is at can you help me there's the same like the context of the communication is the same but the way that I deliver it it's the plus sparks so it's an right. extra thing so when people say like oh I wasn't flirting I just asked them what's good on the menu it's like yeah you didn't ask them what's good on the menu you said like uh you look like you actually have some really great taste can you tell me like <laughs> what what on this menu what would you pick on the menu like that's different you know what I mean so it's like the, mm -hmm. it's the plus sparks element which makes it also too something you can just do all day long to various people and doesn't have to necessarily be be sexual in nature. It doesn't have to necessarily have a, a goal uh, to it. Like I don't flirt because I want something from somebody or I want it to go somewhere. I do it because communicating with a little extra something is just more fun. Giving somebody a compliment that's a little just saucy is just more fun. It'll brighten their day. It makes my day better knowing that I gave them a good exchange. So I think if we don't look at flirting as something that's like only exclusive to people that we want to romanticize, it can just become like when you said it's juvenile i like it for that reason mm. right like i like it because it's like nostalgic it's a thing that i do that i'm like i'm just a flirty little teen you know um <laughs> it's something that's kind of innocent i guess is the right right word i would use yeah. for it i think sometimes well i think why i don't like it is because sometimes it feels 
like you're dumbing yourself down or it's contrived. But what you're saying doesn't feel like that. It's just adding like a little spice almost, which I think is really important. And I think that's how you kind of radiate, radiate that desirability, but also, you know, show desire for someone too. Like I remember a past partner of mine was like, you were flirting with me so much. And that's when I knew like I should make a move. And I'm like, I was flirting with you. Like, yeah. what? <laughs> like I had no idea. So I think sometimes it is important because it gives people signals. But I think sometimes maybe people overthink it. Like what tips would you have for people to kind of bake it in more in a more natural way. Yeah. Other than asking for where the wood section is, because I I, <laughs> right. I feel like that is just so that is just a misleading question. In general. For <laughs> Everyone's gonna be like going up to random people just saying I'm just sticking with the Home Depot theme, guys. Okay. <laughs> Everyone just stop listening, go to Home Depot <laughs> right now. <laughs> You know what's interesting about flirting and that people say like I didn't even know I was flirting or I can't tell if someone's flirting. You're you are biologically designed to flirt and you are also biologically designed to pick up when someone is flirting with you, which are in the pickup artistry world known as IOIs or indicators of interest. Mm. So hmm. even if you're not intentionally like excuse me, where's the lumber section? Your <laughs> voice when you're around someone that you're attracted to goes higher. Your pupils mm. dilate, you fidget, you groom yourself. So you fix your hair or mm. you tap your skin. Like you try to expose more of yourself and your skin. You are pelvis to pelvis with that person. Um, like your body language is open to them. And so you're, even if you don't think to yourself like, oh, I'm doing this flirting thing, your body is like, I would like to do something with this person probably sexual. Um, and we want to indicate that to that individual. And then that person's brain is like, oh, this person is indicating to me that they like to do something sexual with me because like, again, like mating is something that we have to do to survive. And so your biology or history said to itself, like not everyone's going to be great at this. So we'll just help them out and just have it baked in. That to be said, um, if you want to be more flirty, I think researching what those things are and exaggerating them, like mirroring is a great one. So mm -hmm. when we are attracted to somebody, we naturally will copy whatever emotions they're doing. And again, someone's brain picks up, oh, this person is copying me. One, that can be a thing, but also two, people are attracted to similar. You now we always say opposites attract, but it's like the exact opposite. The more same someone is to you, the more that you will be attracted to them. But mirroring their body language, language is, a, is a great, easy way to do that. Again, I think just showing an interest in somebody is a great flirty technique. And then like we said, like even just steering the topics towards more arousing things in general, even if there isn't necessarily like chemistry between the two of you, that arousal transfer can activate to open someone's brain to the possibility of there being chemistry. And then that can go somewhere. Right. And then how do you, you touch upon um, the pickup community and that community kind of talks about flirting, but also talk about game playing. How do you differentiate the two so that people are flirting, but without kind of like the mind games? I think it's weird to have an intention for someone that you don't know, right? Mm. Like it's weird for me to be like, I want to be best friends with you. And we've never had a conversation. I don't but you know do, you. right? I mean, that's not weird, but I'm saying as an anecdote, obviously that's very logical, but I think the thing with pickup artistry that's problematic is being like, I want to have sex with that person. And so I've devised a game plan and I'm going to walk over there and I've got five different techniques I can utilize because in the end, I want to have sex with that person. Like, mm. You don't know anything about that person. You don't know what their sexual preferences are, what their likes are, if the two of you would be compatible. You don't know if your body chemistry works. Right. You know when you just kiss somebody and you don't know why, but like their saliva just doesn't, and they, they don't have bad breath, but you're like, something about your spit and my spit is just not working. Or like, not that I hate the way that you smell, but it's just like something about it's not good to me. So there's so many factors that come into play with deciding what role somebody should or shouldn't play into your life. And so I think pickup artistry could benefit from curiosity. I think curiosity plus strategy plus communication is the perfect formula because um, I do like what pickup artistry does in that it takes the guesswork out of a really mm -hmm. big part of our life. Uh, I think with a lot of um, women centric dating advice or dating, you know, blogs or books, it's all really vague advice and it's not like scientific and step by step. That's why in the game of desire, I wanted it's a five phase program. Because I don't want to just tell people like, be more confident because it's like, right. bitch, 
fucking duh. Like how, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? You know, like <laughs> be more, you know, just be more mysterious. Like if for somebody who's not mysterious, that doesn't make any sense. So I like the fact that they say be more, whatever word they, they would use, like um, be more flamboyant. And to do that, buy clothes in this color scheme. Pick out one crazy hat. Have a canned response that you walk over to somebody with that accentuates the fact that you are somebody who exists on the outlier of society. And here are some five canned responses you can use as an example. So then now this thing that feels like untangible becomes really realistic for you and practical to apply. So I appreciate that side of it, but I just don't think that you should you know, practice these things and become an expert at them so that you can make anyone fall in love with you or make anyone want to have sex with you because you should value yourself enough to know that not everyone should be having sex with you. Not everybody is worthy right. of accessing your love and loving. Mm, amen. Amen to that. So if we were to just put all of this into practice here for all of our listeners, because they span the whole gamut of single and actively dating, those are in relationships, those are getting out of relationships. How can we, let's just look at three scenarios and how can we help each group of people become more desirable? So the single and actively dating group. Become more desirable. One, first and foremost, really watch what your base attitudes are. So if mm. you are single and actively dating, ask yourself, what do I think about dating? What do I think about first dates? What do I think about meeting new people? What do I think about the process of looking for new people? I find a lot of people have a really negative attitude, yes. a really negative gut yes. reaction to those things. And that shows up. Definitely. So if you <laughs> hate first dates and you dread it, it's just going to show up in every process of the interaction. So that is to say, not that your experiences aren't valid. Like you could hate it, good reason, but then you should also acknowledge like, okay, well, what is the common denominator that's leading me to this negative thing over and over again? So at the baseline of it all, like what's a date? A date is two people who have no real connection to each other. Like it's not that we're neighbors or that mm -hmm. you can get me, help me get a promotion at work um, or you're my butcher or maybe you're my hot ass butcher, but I'm not dating Damn. you because I want, <laughs> you know, the best cut of meat. I'm dating you because I'm two people who don't really have any other agenda other than just to see if there's something there who are setting time aside to get to know one another. But like as a married person, it's very rare that I just meet somebody who's like, do you want to just go for coffee later? Right? Like if we're, about, do we have a job together coming up? Like, is there, <laughs> right. like why, why, you know, why am I making time for you? Just to see if we have something and no pressure. If we don't, then we'll just unmatch and go separate ways. But I'm just curious to see if we have something like that doesn't happen. So if you can just look at it, like this is a really cool time. I met more people when I was single and dating than I do as a partnered person. Mm -hmm. You're just meeting more interesting people. And I say this all the time when I started to date with intention more and my screening process was better. I didn't meet a lot of people that I spent my life with. Obviously I chose one person, but the people that I met on dates, I hired to do graphic design work for me, or they did paintings mm -hmm. for me. One mm -hmm. person that I dated before I got married styled my engagement shoot. Like mm -hmm. um, I met people who helped me uh, reach out to distributors in China because they had a link with them. So I met mm -hmm. cool people who had still interesting quality. stories. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It could still be a great exchange. And so if you kind of take the pressure off of it to like lead to the one, and just to be one bomb ass experience with a really cool undercurrent underneath it, I feel like that makes a really big impact. You know what? I figured this out. I'm like, why am I talking so fucking much in this podcast? You guys are asking me lifetime achievement questions. So <laughs> none of these are like short answers. It's not, you know, like, what should I wear on a first date? Um, and I'm like, black. Next question. So you're saying we're not basic. We're going we're deep. We're not basic. We're going deep. Because I keep being like, God damn, like, take a breath. But then I'm like, these are hard questions. So you're just dropping like, all the knowledge. For Give us. all the nuances. So anybody who's listening, who's like, God damn, she can talk. It's just, listen, the questions aren't easy. You try it. <laughs> yeah, you try this at home. You try writing a book. Uh, <laughs> what about those people that are in a relationship and things are going well, but they want to like up the desire. Yeah. I think an easy, I have a quiz on my website that's called turn on triggers. And that's a great base way to start because I think a lot of people take for advantage. Again, when you first get into a relationship, you have the neurochemical cocktail that's giving you all of the setup that you need. So I'm already thinking about sex when I see you. Now for people who are in a long-term relationship, you don't look at that person and think sex because to UA's point, you might look at that person and think, 
grocery list, look at that person and think mm -hmm. like, oh, did you pay the gas bill? Because there's just so much more complexities to our relationship. So in order to get the person prime where they're in a space where they see sex when they see you, you have to know what turns that person on. And so a turn on trigger is important to note because it's that cue that says, here's what I'm trying to achieve with you. So for my relationship, my husband's turn on trigger is environmental. So mm. I, if I wanted to communicate to him that I want this to now be a sexy atmosphere, I have to like clean up, plug in a Glade shit thing, mm. you know, even wearing something. Um, but cleaning up is a massive one. Like he can't have sex around mess. He's also not an exhibitionist. So if the blinds are open, he's distracted mm. the whole time. No so way. Really? That. Yeah, he is. So <laughs> it's crazy, girl. And like sometimes I'll just push him and try it. Like, let's just do it with the blinds open. It's not enjoyable because the whole time he's like right. looking over his shoulder. I'm like, fucking just ignore it, Jared. Let's move on. But he can't. So <laughs> like, like, I already saw oh. tickets. It's gotten their watching. <laughs> he cannot, he can't get it out of his head that like someone could come up, someone's looking. So I, on the other hand, um, am direct language. So if you want to get me in a space, it could be the dirtiest environment, all the blinds could be open. But if you look at me and you're like, holy fuck, you're you look like the kind of person I would masturbate to. That in itself, I'm like, close off. Uh, <laughs> now, if I tried that on Jared and it hasn't, right. you know, worked as well. So sometimes the thing that we would like for ourselves, not what our other partner would like. So I think taking the quiz together as much as yeah. you know, maybe not be against that, but that can just open up a dialogue of knowing, okay, if I do want, if I feel horny and I want my partner to be on the same wavelength, what's the extra step that I can do to try to get them in the same headspace? Right, mm -hmm. right. And would you have the same answer for couples who've been in a relationship for a long time? Let's say they've hit quite a few milestones already. Uh, I would say to that couple, go to Cancun, hire somebody. <laughs> to sit. No, I'm playing. Um, <laughs> I think if, yeah, I think remaining curious um, and then pivoting with the changes, not always making the change a bad thing is an, is an important one to note. Um, I also think that spicing it up in the bedroom does not have to be as extreme as going to Cancun, but mm -hmm. you do have to spice it up, right? Like your favorite food, you know, when you have like a spot, you're like oh, my favorite spaghetti is at this spot on the street. And after you have it for two years straight, even though it's the same and great food, uh, it might not hit the same for you. And that's just because your brain becomes accustomed to it. And that's kind of the downfall to us being such rapid advancers, right? The the iPhone's a perfect product and they've reinvented that shit like fucking 14 times or 11, right. whatever iPhone 11 X9 that we're on right now. Like, mm -hmm. What a crazy thing. Like there's this stupid brick that like can lock, it can do everything, right? And it's still not good enough. So don't look at it like changes mm. and looking to spice things up is a reflection of a failure. It's just the human condition that things have to evolve and be different in order for us to be continued excited about it. And that's our benefit and our curse. And it also applies to your sex life. I love Great that. words. There's so many takeaways from this conversation. It's like, where do we even start? I mean, I think one that definitely comes that kind of follows what you were just saying of uh, of change being an inevitable, but it's how you look at it. And I love this like mindset shift, whether that is, you know, how we talk about dating current day or how we even describe flirting. Like I think I even have been brought to the other side that I definitely like flirting and do it. It's just whatever connotation I have with it is, you know, that's a shift that needs to happen, that it can be something that is super sexy and not cheesy and all the stuff that you think. But you know what the gift of our language is too? You can also shift the word like I for whatever reason just don't like masturbation and I know mm. that's a great thing and there's like masturbation may and all these other things but the word just feels like ugh, I don't know so I yeah. use self-pleasure instead mm. so same shit but I think yeah. you know, if flirting feels like ugh, like you roll your eyes at yourself there's probably another word for it like I don't know energetically exchanging <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. That one. <laughs> totally. But I think like my biggest takeaway for this whole conversation is especially when it comes to, you know, seduction and flirting and um, desire. So often we're looking for those tips and like the script that we should do. And I feel like what I've gathered from you is sometimes we need to just not overthink it. We need to just like let things radiate and, you know, like push ourselves so our own personalities are showing through. And that's what's going to like start to radiate that or draw to like call in someone and make them feel good. Like there's things that we can do that are natural to us that aren't like a quick fix and, you know, a hack necessarily. But these are the ways 
ways that like we remain desirable, whether it's the start of a relationship or years and years into one. Here, here, Julie. Here, here, <laughs> indeed. My biggest takeaway, in addition to Julie's takeaway, is can, can I just say, say this feels like an immediate Yelp, Yelp review? review? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> atmosphere was great. The food yeah. was okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And service was blah, but I give it three and a half stars because <laughs> they gave me free wine. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my biggest takeaway for this restaurant, Shan uh, Boudram, is uh, I, I feel like I don't know what makes me desirable. And I Thanks. should start asking that question. I could have a theory about what makes me desirable, but I've actually never asked my partner straight up, what do you desire about me? And that may actually just make me really horny just to hear that. <laughs> and a lot of this just comes from so much self-awareness and knowing one, what is, what makes someone desirable? What is, what is it that makes you desirable? And how do we constantly work this muscle so that we keep increasing our desirability factor? And it is something that we can work on. It is something that we can you know, constantly think about and be more mindful about. And it's not something that just comes naturally. I just love in movies that desirability just comes out of nowhere. And it's like, whoa, two, two strangers meet on a train. It's like, oh my God. And then things just happen. It doesn't happen that easily, or at least, at least not to most people. So it's nice to know that it is in our control, that we, we can yes. work on this. I'm glad you said that to you about just like asking, because that's something that Shad, I heard you say over and over again. I feel like we have been talking thought that desirability you're supposed to be mysterious and you're not supposed to like say what you really want but just so much that you've said in this is just I just put it out there and that's how someone you can't expect someone to be a mind reader and I'd rather get my needs met and I think that's so important that that confidence can come through and it doesn't always have to be the way we've been like told that we're supposed to do these types of like behaviors a hundred percent I think that that's just a part of it's a trade-off though. I will say that there is an exchange that happens when you have to tell somebody what you want and then they do mm -hmm. it versus someone just naturally guessing it. And it depends on what you value. And like I said, I value my needs being met. I desire, I desire for my desires to matter out there in the world and to come to fruition. And so I want more control over them. But for the person who it's like the surprise element is what they desire, then don't talk about it. Keep it silent and hope you meet a mind reader and you might. Good right. luck. Man, and just keep getting deeper on that because even your initial question, what do you desire right now? I All I could think about was ice cream and then you fucking come up with the answer that you need a flirt buddy. I'm like, I never even thought of that as an option. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I feel like I should just be asking myself even more questions. I gotta put questions. it out there because somebody could be listening to this podcast who's like, I'm the perfect person. You know what I mean? Girl. If I don't say it, they're not gonna know. So I gotta put it out there. You might get hit up, just say. <laughs> uh, a thousand percent. <laughs> Yes. Yes. A thousand percent possibility of a flirt partner coming your way from Home Depot. Just saying. But <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, what do I say? To this? Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's like, or the generic answer that you're supposed to say. So it does show that maybe we're not thinking about it enough. And if we're not thinking about it enough, how could you expect your partner to be? I thought you were going to say, Julie, if we're not thinking about it enough, you guys for damn sure aren't thinking about it enough <laughs> because we're ahead of you. <laughs> too. <laughs> I would love it if a listener wrote in with like this really detailed one that just put all of ours to shame. That would be amazing. I've been thinking about this actually. So yeah, <laughs> like I would ready for this question. <laughs> yeah, here's my list. Uh, Shant, tell us a little bit about your new show. We plugged your book. You're welcome. And then we also want to plug your new show, X-Rated. What is it about? Because the preview I saw, you hooked someone up to a lie detector test to help her find her vulnerability. I was like, damn, that's a whole other level. What is this show about? So in essence, you come to the show and say, I'm single and I can't figure out why. And then there is a 21 question survey that is issued out to your exes, ranging from hookup buddies to ex fiancés. And they rate you on a scale of one to 10 on these 21 different categories. And then Andy Cohen, who's the host of the show, basically walks you through expectation versus reality. What do you think you are? What are you actually? Wow. And then once we identify what someone's weakest area is, I come in and I do an exercise with them um, to see 
see if we can improve that score. Cause not just about embarrassing you on TV and saying, ha ha ha, you thought that you were great at foreplay, you're actually trash. It's okay, cool. Well, let's figure out like, how do we improve that your ability to be a better partner in this way right now? And so the lie detector thing, that person in particular had a really hard time with vulnerability because they were a dominatrix. And so much of that is about control and restraint and not sharing what your humanity, but using the tools that you know to bring out somebody else's humanity. But what I was explaining to her is that in needing to maintain that control by not showing people your true emotions, she was actually giving other people more control over her life because everybody else was like, I think that she left early because of this. And that wasn't her truth. Or I think that she closed up or stopped calling altogether because I didn't do this. And that wasn't her truth. So you have other people who are now in control of your narrative because you're so concerned with keeping things, you know, keeping your cards close to your chest. So the lie detector was, you know, those things are not necessarily scientifically true. It was more a device to illustrate, you know, uh, what can happen when you go beyond what you think you're supposed to say. Interesting. I cannot wait to watch this. So it's on Peacock TV. Where else? Where can you watch it? Yeah, so it's on Peacock, which is NBC's streaming app. It was the place you would go to watch the Olympics if you watched the Olympics at all this year. And um, all eight episodes have already dropped. It is bingeable. It is cringeable. It is lovable. <laughs> and so I hope people check it out. Oh, yes. I know what I'm doing tonight. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and Shannon, if people want to find out more about you, where what's the best place? place to go to i'm guessing your website we've, we've given them too much homework i think we should just stop you know we told them to read the book we told them to watch the x-rated show they're busy never they're met a guest them. who's just like stop promoting me yeah i'm done because <laughs> well, i know the human brain can only like pick up three pieces of information so we've already like m hit our max so this is just me to double down and say get the book it's on audible if you are fascinated by this you can get audible uh you get a free book when you sign up for audible so i read that shit you like my voice go get that or watch the peacock show that's it you want to Read, say. read. You want to watch some shit? Watch, watch some shit. <laughs> you got something for everyone. Something for everybody. <laughs> or if you just want to self pleasure, you just self pleasure. You know what? Exactly. You do you. Yeah. Do you. Home Depot accepts everybody. Everybody is welcome at Home Depot. If you want to feel desired? That's where you go. Yes. That's where you go. <laughs> Where's the wood section? Okay. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, Shan. Thanks so much for making this happen it's been a miracle so woo, miracles do happen uh, I can't wait for all of our listeners to give us their feedback because I'm sure this is going to elicit a lot of feedback from everybody <laughs> who comes in contact um, for all of our listeners you know what we desire is <laughs> reviews in Apple Podcasts five stars <laughs> That's where the wood comes in. When you give us five stars, we're like, that's, you got to the wood section. Yes, you navigated yourself there. So yes, if you can give us five stars, that is lovely. And if you can give us a little like blurb, a little blurb from the club of why you gave us five stars is even better. Uh, it helps us get amazing guests like Shan, um, who, it, you know, agree to talk to us. That is the damn truth. <laughs> the only way that I get booked on podcasts is if they have the number, it's the number of reviews that the, um, my management team bases it on. So it, a thousand percent is true. You think it's a superfluous thing. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for validating us. I feel seen. I feel heard. I feel good. And now we can wrap up this episode. Stay Stay oh, oh, oh. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Freakonomics Radio is sponsored by Adidas. 
check out the latest footwear innovation from Adidas, the Adi Zero Adios Pro 2, which features carbon fiber energy rods that are both lightweight and precisely tuned for a more anatomical transition. Everything from the ultra-light polyester upper to the re-sculpted midsole and the reinvented outsoles are designed for speed. Visit adidas.com to learn more today. I'm Katie Grossman, the ultra marathon runner sponsored by New Balance. I'm also a creative professional, wife, and mom. Life has gotten crazy, especially after battling a tumor, but running still improves my life, both physically and mentally. Go beyond the run at newbalance.com.